So we just started with the same thing that we had yesterday, performance parameters, and then starting with the static measures, we move to dynamic measures. For the static measures, the question is what would be now the impact? Specifically, we were concerned about INL DNL because gain error or offset error don't create a severe problem. So therefore, we focus on INL DNL issue. So the first question I ask before you come was just simply assume we have a differential architecture. What will happen if we have mismatch? Because mismatch is one of the reasons we see DNL. So, of course, uh, one of you res responded that uh, you will see even harmonics grow, which is true. Therefore, the same thing will happen here. Suppose if you have a data converter which shows severe DNL issues, so naturally you will see harm even harmonics grow. Now what will happen in the performance, final performance, when even harmonics grow? So you know, what was the one of the specs which is very much related to extra spurious frequency components? Dynamic range or less spurious free dynamic range. Exactly. So if this spurious free dynamic range is important because of the fidelity of the signal which is reproduced, therefore effectively you will lose in that. So these are like a chain of effects which will happen if there is severe DNL. And overall, DNL is generated because of the mismatch effects. Of course, could be because of other effects, but mismatch is one of the reasons. Mismatch itself is not a deterministic process. Therefore, it's a random process. And therefore, variables associated with the components values are also random variables with respect to their mean value. They will show random fluctuations. So therefore, what we would expect effectively, if you look at the performance with respect to SNR, it's just like that you have increased quantization. Because still you have the same random nature. It's just like you are adding one more component to the random noise. We have quantization noise. We have thermal noise. We have collector noise. We have other sources of random noise. Now we have one more effect which is indirectly coming from the components effects. So therefore, you will see effectively it is equivalent by saying that SQNR has increased, uh, sorry, has reduced, means quantization noise has increased, effective quantization. Okay, so this is one effect that you would observe eventually noise floor is more than what you expect if you have the end. And even if you plot DNL as a function of code, you will see almost it looks random. It's not exactly random because it may happen that for a range of code, it will show more peak-to-peak -peak variation and for a range of code, it will show less. So this happens, but overall, it shows a random behavior. Okay, so this is the summary which is written here. I have not written even harmonics, for example, here, but I can add it as a bullet item later on, but these are like some examples. So therefore, what you expect is the effective. If you call it effective SQNR, it will reduce it. Or effectively, at the end of the day, SNR will reduce. Now, what about integral nonlinearity? What about INL? INL usually is produced because of the systematic variations, not because of the random mismatch. So this systematic variations eventually results in a kind of curve as a static characteristics of ADC rather than a simple linear characteristics. So therefore, you expect effectively to see distortion, right? So because of that effect. So that is effectively distortion. And that's why still harmonics start increasing. And in the case of INL, even odd harmonics start increasing. So therefore, again, that spurious free dynamic range will start dropping. So you will see again more and more distortion in the characteristics of the frequency domain characteristics of the ADC or the spectrum of the signal. Yes, because as you know, INL eventually is the integration of DNL or because this is not actually integration, it's summation. Yesterday we discussed. But the point is that it's like that, look at that way. Suppose if you have DNL, 
when you add DNL, you are integrating, right? So therefore, effectively, you are enhancing the low frequency components. That means you are shaping that randomness. So therefore, the spectrum is not the in the in the uh, DNL, you may expect effectively to have, of course, even harmonics may grow, but also noise floor also will come up. In the INL, because it's an integrated version, so you expect to see more growth of harmonics as compared to the entire noise floor to come up. So these are the differences. Of course, DNL also doesn't have that kind of pure random nature. Therefore, you will not exp you will not see also the enhancement uh, increase in the noise floor just equally like a white noise. It will not behave like a white, but definitely it shows more randomness as compared to in uh, INL. Of course, these are all applicable if you give enough time. That means these are static characteristics. Means that we are giving enough time to the ADC output to settle or DAC output to settle. If we don't give, other issues will come. Yeah, so this, this only we need to keep it. That's why these are only static characteristics. But overall, if you want to look, all of them reduce signal to noise ratio, but the effect is more pronounced in even harmonics for INL. In odd harmonics with respect to INL, uh, DNL, in odd harmonics with respect to INL, also we will see enhancement of the noise floor because of the uh, DNL. We will see also eventually because of both effects, reduction in SFDR. So, this behavior is observed finally as a result of the INFT. See, if you have a differential amplifier and you apply a sine wave, so, and assume you have, you don't have perfect linear characteristics because, say, MOSFETs are a square law, right? So, what kind of harmonics of this sine wave will appear at the output? Differential in differential function. Yeah, so that is exactly the reason. So, only odd values will appear, odd harmonics. But when you add mismatch, then you don't have cancellation of the odd harmonics in the differential output. That's why they start to look. Yeah, but that is also having differential architecture, right? We are all talking about differential architecture. Okay? In general, in general, even if we assume we are talking about a single edit architecture, which is almost like nowhere you can find these days, except of course in the facilities or equipment, measurement equipment, which work with high voltage. Still, if you have nonlinearity, that means you are adding to the harmonics, both even and odd. So even in first principle, it still is bad. As long as you have nonlinearity, you are adding to the harmonics, you are reducing the same. Okay, so it's very simple, but it's very easy also to relate it to the characteristics. So now what about dynamic measures? Now dynamic measures talk about the behavior of the ADC or DAG with respect to time, timing characteristics. So of course, delay and settling time are very well known. I don't need to explain that. So at the end of the day, you need to wait for the, if, even from starting from sampling, starting from anti-aliasing filter. So you, everywhere you have these characteristics. Specifically in DAC, when you apply the code, by the time you see the code, see the analog output, there is a delay. In the ADC, when you sample at the, when the clock edge comes, till you get the sample uh, to get to get the code, there is a delay. But here, the, really, these are not the main things we are talking about. What we have to be careful about is always settling time, which was very well explained when we were talking about the sampling. Because if we don't take care of settling time of the analog parts of this path, so it will add to the distortion. So this is not something very uh, strange and something which is very well known. But one thing which is not very well uh, explained and discussed till now is this aperture error. See, we have considered always sampling clock is an ideal edge. It's an ideal clock with ideal edges. 
practically there is a G pair. So therefore, every sample with respect to the previous sample will not be captured with the separation of T seconds. It will be T plus delta T. And this delta T is a random variable which has an RMS value. So that's the jitter. So the edge of the clock will arrive at different times. So therefore we have kind of uncertainty in the sampling. That is mean eventually equivalent by saying that you have cycle to cycle jitter. Therefore cycle period of the clock is not T. It is T plus delta T when delta T is random. So now what would be the effect? So imagine you have a signal which is coming. Okay. So when signal has its maximum sample to sample variation, you will get the maximum error, right? Suppose signal value is V1 at time T1, sampling time T1. Now we go to the sampling time T2, which is supposed to be T1 plus T. T is the period of sampling. But now it is T1 plus T plus some delta T. So we have a delta T error, so shift in time to the left or to the right. Similar to that, we will have a delta V, the sampled output. So what is this value of delta T? Delta V depends on the input. Not input itself, but rate of change of it. Therefore, for getting what would be really the peak variation due to this, we just need to know what at what time this input has its maximum variation. So we know, say suppose you have a sine wave. You know a sine wave with the amplitude of Vm will have its maximum slope as Vm omega, where omega is the frequency of sine wave. So if Vm omega is the maximum slope and then you have a delta t error, so Vm multiplied by omega multiplied by delta t is the error that you get in the sample value. So now because delta t is a random variable, delta v also becomes a random variable. You, exactly, you can consider it. I mean, uh, you go faster than me, right? I will explain now what is the, again, consequences of that. So, uh, let's, uh, so let's assume we have a signal. And uh, this signal of V in that we are sampling has some slope. Okay, so this will be dv in by dt. And then it has some absolute max value. This is just to get the peak to peak variations. So now if I have this maximum variation and then I have a delta t as a random variable, this is a random variable which is uh, Showing the effect of jitter. So therefore, the period of the clock eventually could be t plus delta t. So delta t could be a random variable, which is, for example, between two values of, say, minus delta by 2 and uh, plus delta by 2. Suppose it's a random variable. So therefore, now what will happen here? So when I sample at a particular time, which was suppose t, I would expect to get v in of t. But I get v in of t plus delta. And delta t is random variable. So sample to sample, I have random variations because of this random variable. So what would be the difference? That is the error, right? So therefore, v in of t plus delta t. Minus v in of t. t is eventually the sampling time or value of input that the sampling time will be shown by v in of t. So if I have this kind of like first class. So this is eventually error. So this is effectively sampling error and this is a random variable. Now look, what would be this v in if time shifts by delta t? Because delta t is not a very high value like jitter. We assume that we have a good design, that we have a good distribution of the clock, and then the clock is produced from a 
clock synthesizer. So in that case, delta t is not very high. That means delta value is not very high. So I can write this value almost approximated by this slope dv in by dt multiplied by delta t. Right? So if I have a very small delta t, I can just approximate this error as this. So naturally, if I have more variation, more slope, Eventually, faster variation of the input, I will get faster. I will get more. And that's why the maximum absolute slope of the input is a measure for calculating how much would be the peak to peak error. Okay, assuming positive and negative slope are same, so I will get eventually this dv in, dv in by dt max absolute value multiplied by delta t max. This is the peak data. Amplitude of the jitter. So now what happens with this error? So the effectively what will happen means that your sample inputs, which are happening at time of nt, now will be represented by, this is v in actual, this is v in of nt, plus this random error. So we can call it v with a small, so I call it due to, Aperture error. So this this is a random variable and effectively behaves like a noise because source of that also is a noise. So that means your input samples are superimposed with a noise, right? So therefore, the same way flicker noise or thermal noise or any kind of random noise adds to your sample, this also will add to your samples. If we look at other way, so this is just a simply therefore it adds noise. Right, so the same effect that we see for other source of no noise will happen here. So we expect again SNR to reduce. You can look at it the other way round, also like as uh, he mentioned. You can look at this this way. Like for example, we have if we don't wait enough, we have an error, right? And that is settling error. Settling error also is not really perfectly random, but in general, assuming input is very active. It can find a random nature. So this also is equivalent by saying you have settling time error. Like input was supposed to be at time t, so you have not waited enough to get it, you got something else. So it's just like that. Independent of whether you have positive or negative jitter. So it means you wait more than what you are supposed to wait or you don't wait. Because here is not I mean, you can call it settling time, equivalent with settling time error, but the best thing is just to just look at this as an additional noise, which is added. It, and it's added sample by sample. So this is equivalent by saying that your input had a noise and the sample did. In fact, if you add this noise to your input and sample at proper times, stamps, so you have the same. So therefore, it behaves like an additive this aperture noise. We have other specifications which are already defined. And if you notice, all of them are coming from frequency spectrum characteristics. That means, effectively, when we want to look at the characteristics of the, no, uh, the uh, data converter in time domain, other than jitter, it's better to look at the frequency domain. Just simply looking at the frequency domain, and then we have all these components together in one single set of characteristics. Because SNDR, SFDR, noise floor, and even later, this noise floor will be the effect of added jitter. This noise floor will be due to DNL. And then other components like SFDR due to INL. SFDR can also do, be due to DNL. So therefore, all effects are uh, obtained in, from Frequency spectrum, that's why then it is really enough you have the uh, proper FFT. Now, what is the meaning of proper FFT? Means that you need to have enough number of points. That plays a vital role, specifically for extremely high performance. When we call high performance, means very high SMDR. So, that's it. So, therefore, we don't need really to be so worried about 
these specifications because we get all from frequency characteristics. We don't need to really stay in time domain because it's not very straightforward to stay in time domain and then extract the characteristics. But these are the performance parameters. And as you see, there are so many of them. So how to compare now data converters when you have so many parameters? So each one of them finally has some effect either on the frequency characteristics or on some parameters which are the summarized parameters or summary of the parameters. What are the summary of parameters at the end of the day? You want an ADC to have some well-defined resolution. This is one. You want an ADC to handle a signal with a given bandwidth, two. And three, you want an ADC to work with a given full scale range with a reasonable or acceptable power dissipation or energy dissipation. So effectively, we are all we are talking about is this, right? So therefore, we can define figure of merits, which eventually tries to combine them. Of course, this figure of merits are not enough at all, but they provide some kind of combination of this state together in one or two states. So which will help to compare ADCs. Otherwise, if you want to compare different designs with respect to all these values, you don't know how to combine them. So you have 10 different characteristics. So something reduces, something increases. Finally, which one, which set is better? That's why figure of merits are different. Because this needs a little analysis, so I uh, write on notes. I don't have slides. So what are these figure of merits? But then I will show you Boris Mormon uh, ADC surveys based on this figure of merits. And then, uh, and he updates it year by year. So we will see the latest updates that he has. It is available from his website. So we have two figure of merits, which are relatively old. But still, they are used. One is called Walden figure of merits. And one is Schreer figure of merits. Schreer was in analog devices and then he has published books. He has published many papers and then his focus has gone on Delta Sigma 86. But in general, he has a kind of background and a strong background on eventual 86. But what is the difference between these two and then at from what angle each one of them looks? Which one is older? Well, then figure of merit is one. So therefore, this is the first figure of merit practically was presented. And then he published a paper for this figure of merit more than 30 years ago. It's available if you want to just check Walden paper from Google Scholar for your information. I wanted to give it as a reference, but I don't want because that's not, I'm not asking you to read it, only if you have interest to read that paper. So what this figure of merit says? It says that, okay, we always know that effective number of bits what happens for architecture, what kind of speed you have, what kind of bandwidth always matters. Therefore, he looks at enough as well. So now he says that, okay, so how many levels you can get with this? So you will get effectively 2 to the power enough, right? So this is the number of levels. So, and suppose signal bandwidth is shown by DW signal bandwidth. So what is the sampling, Nike's sampling rate? So which is called FSNIQ is two times of bandwidth. Fine. So till now we have this specification. So signal bandwidth, enough number of levels. One more is the power dissipation. Okay. So the figure of merit well then defines. So therefore we call it FOMW is this figure of it. And then we, I tell you what does that mean. SP, power dissipation, two times of bandwidth, multiplied by two to the power, 
two types of bandwidth is F sin uh, F S like this. So sometimes it is written as P upon F S like this multiplied by two with power two. Okay. So what does it say is that what is P upon F S like this? It is actually P multiplied by T F S like this, right? So therefore I can write it P multiply by t as my test divided by 2 to the power n. So p is the average power you consume to convert a sample to a given code, right? So you generate a code. So depending on the number of this enough, you generate a code. So if you look at the numerator, it is p multiplied by t t s like this. That means if the p is the average power which is consumed to generate the code, if you multiply it by one cycle of the sampling clock, you will get the energy which is consumed in one cycle of it, right? So therefore, effectively, it goes to energy, which is correct. At the end of the day, we are interested in total energy, which is this energy. But because enough is the all number of bits, and the total number of levels that we have is two to the power enough. Effectively, input signal always is within one of these segments. So therefore, per segment, the energy which is dissipated is normalized to the number of segments because if you have more number of segments and energy per segment remains constant so you will get better today because you have not changed the energy per segment but you have increased the number of bits so if we consider this case so effectively, it normalizes this energy which is consumed to the total number of levels, which is a representative of total number of bits. This figure of minute was is relatively old. So what it was telling is that effectively, if you want suppose for example add one bit to a so suppose we have an ADC and we want to add one bit to this ADC. Suppose we have a 10 bit ADC, we want to make it 11 bit ADC. How much really we have to spend and more energy? So let's assume bandwidth of the signal remains same and FS Nikes or TS Nikes remains same. In older days, resolution was not very high. That's why to increase resolution, you had to only to take care of settling time. That means you, you were not so worried about thermal noise because full scale range was very high, number of it was relatively low. So you had really didn't have any problem with thermal noise, for example, floor. All you had to take care was the settling time. Therefore, if you wanted to add a number of bits, suppose if we were designing 30 years ago, we had to just simply be worried about the faster charging and discharging of capacitors which are used for the sampling. And because the thermal noise was not an issue, so therefore nobody was even changing C. These days, if you want to improve resolution, more often you end up having higher C sampling capacitor. But therefore all matter at those days was if you just increase the energy, by the same factor, because if I want to add one bit, so effectively I have to charge faster by a factor of two. So that means I have to increase the current by a factor of two. That means I have to increase energy by a factor of two, keeping FS like the same. That means figure of merit remains constant. So what eventually Walden was trying to say is that this captures how power and resolution trade with each other. Based on the Older data conductors. And that's why this works very well. And the seal is used. The seal is used because we call it enough. Therefore, we capture effect of signal to noise ratio, thermal noise, everything. But the behavior of this figure of merit doesn't follow the behavior he had in mind these days. 
because these days when you want to increase resolution, you end up increasing C. When you increase C and you have to increase also the settling, uh, increase the current, so you will end up increasing power much more. So this figure of merit will degrade, means it will increase. So it will not remain constant the way he expect. So that's why this is, uh, this is not always following the trade-offs very well, but still, at least it shows trade off definitely. If I want to improve resolution, I will end up spending more power for a given signal. So that's why Scherrier came and then defined another figure of merit, which is the same, but explain it in a different way. So what he said is that, you know this relation, right, which comes eventually, that also started from enough. Scherrier also starts from enough. It's the same, but it's slightly different view of that. So, this is the relation we have which explains SNR, total SNR, due to anything, including distortion. Actually, it is SNDR. This is like, I call it SNR total. Total SNR, you see, due to any unknown ideality, is 6.02 in up plus 1.76, right? This is what we derived for a single tone input sine wave, right? This is what we derived also. So if I write only first part, which is the main part, because this is a constant, right? So it becomes 10 log of 4 to the power E naught plus 1.76. Okay. So what Shreer says only is this. It says that, okay, instead of 2 to the power E naught, let's look at 4 to the power And capture directly SNR. But what is SNR actually? Because the SNR we wrote based on this relation, if you remember, was based on the signal, single tone signal with some amplitude of Vm and RMS value of noise, quantization noise. This relation came from there. And then this was actually SQNR. Now, if we replace this with an SNR, instead of N, which was number of bits, we get E of effective number of bits. So it says, okay, let's keep this relation, but let's look at SNR. And SNR is actually a measure of dynamic range now. Because these days noise floor matters. Those days noise floor didn't matter. So these days maximum value of signal and mean value matters. Max value determines distortion. Mean value determines noise flow. And in fact, mean value is limited to noise flow. We are going so down because of the supply scaling that eventually we are hitting the noise flow. So therefore, it's a measure of dynamic range. So it says because it is low, it says that instead of define, defining it in linear scale, let's define it in log scale. And instead of defining it as A upon B, define it B upon A so that it becomes a positive number in log. So therefore, he just simply defined it this way. So figure of merit of Scherrier is same as actually Walden, only just looking from a different angle. So therefore, it ends up to be 10 logo P. Sorry, it comes to the numerator, 4 to the power E naught divided P multiply by T Nyquist, sorry, NYT, Nyquist. Sometimes in uh, some literature, they separate them also, because see, if you look, this is eventually a measure of this 10 log of SNR, is 10 log of 4 to the power in of plus. So this 10 log of 4 to the power e naught is a measure of dynamic range. That's why in some literature, they just separate them from each other. One is 10 log of 4 to the power e naught, which is a measure of dynamic range. And sometimes they even replace it by dynamic range. They call it dynamic range. Minus 10 log of p multiplied by t s nyquist, which is eventually the energy dissipated for conversion. Okay, so now what is this? Now P, it is just simply P multiplied by T C because 
Now, four to the power e naught went into SNR. It got absorbed into dynamic range or SNR. Denominator is just the energy which is dissipated at one cycle of nicest frequency, sampling frequency. Okay, and this figure of merits uh, are relatively still useful and they are being used. So now I show you this recent updates from Professor Mormon's uh, website, how these are nicely used. And in fact, that uh, aperture error, which is aperture error is jitter, it is the only thing we look in time domain. That's why it, it is coming separately. Okay, so he has uh, the ADC survey till 2019. This Excel sheet is available from his website. Let's look at first energy. See, this is P upon Fs Nikes. So this is what we defined as an energy, right? Per cycle of Nikes, which is two, eventually one upon two times of bandwidth, as a function of SNDR in general, at of course same bandwidth, which is half of Nikes. And then look at these two lines. One is figure of Merit Walden, and one is figure of Merit Shelley. So for figure of Merit Walden, it is eventually energy per conversion step, what we call it. So this is the same relation that we have already, right? P multiplied by T, Ts Nikes divided by 2 to the power enough. So that is mentioned in linear scale. Figure of Merit Shirier is in DD, which is this one, is in DD. So for and then they just change these numbers. For example, this is one, if you look, like till 2019, most of the reported works are above this line. And this line is where you have one femtojoule per conversion. And for Sharia, it is 185 dB. And it also shows eventually how energy changes with the SNDR. So similarly, it has for Walden figure of merit as a function of speed, which is F plus Nikes. So that is, yeah, so it tries to create a kind of envelope curve for this characteristic. So this is, this is exactly this figure of merit, Walden figure of merit as a function of Sampling frequency, Nikes like sampling frequency, which is eventually signal band. Then he has also one for aperture. So he plots for two cases because aperture error is defined by the jitter. That's why you have just simply jitter values. One is for one pico second RMS and one is for 0 0.1 pico second RMS. Okay, so and it's interesting. All all we have are these characteristics. One is signal bandwidth, which is captured in FE. One is the SNDR. And one is the energy, which is eventually figure of merit of Y. And these are enough for now to compare the different designs of ADC with each other. Okay, so we can move to the second part. I can explain it quickly, which is about how to measure the NLRNL because simulation is not a big deal. In simulation, you can have a very slow ramp and then start from some initial value, go to the full scale, and then for each value, you get the corresponding code. And then even you can measure exactly what are the transition points because it's simulation. You can even run Monte Carlo and then you get exactly the distribution. It's, and you can even run on top of that variation and then get the entire simulation done. But in measurement, how it is done is very important. So how do we can measure it? That this kind of experiments cannot be done. Simulations cannot be emulated in experiment. Okay, so any question? Yes, yes, exactly. If they are actually same, but they are explained in two different ways. 
Yeah, because if you notice, the only difference is that one is four to the power in up, one is two to the power in up. But effectively, they are coming from same origin, but they are from two different angles because one of them eventually looks at the SNR and energy, and one is look at the energy and resolution. We can look at it that way. But resolution and SNR are again related. That's why they are not independent. There are two different ways of explaining things. Sharia eventually said that if we define this way, we are closer to this is data converters because they are effectively talking about various sources of non-idealities, which were not always the concern when Walden defined it. That's why it went with SNR rather than because here you don't see SNR. No, no, what I mean is that this is 4 to the power in up. So it's directly as This is 2 to the power in up. That's it. That's the only difference. That is because this is coming directly from a SNR. This is 10 log of 4 to the power in up. It's just the relation between a SNR. This is, this is what we have already derived. So it directly relates to this is 10 log of a SNR, 10 log of 4 to the power in up. So means SNR is proportional to 4 to the power. This is the way Sharia looks at this behavior and definition of Enoch. While then look at, looked at Enoch just as a resolution, not really related to SNR and then talks about it. While then actually talks about SNR and relates it to Enoch. It's the opposite. Of looking at the figure, uh, not necessarily. That depends on the architecture and the way you do the ADC conversion. In the sense that, what kind of methodology you use. In fact, when we go with the different methods of analog to digital conversion, you will see how the characteristics can change because of mismatch and the linear uh, variation. This is a systematic variation with some gradient, say linear variation. And one is mismatch, which is completely random. I will show you both. So, but there is, there is no, nothing like that. So, in fact, mismatch could become completely random. Even you can have, say, plus, minus, plus, minus, positive, negative, positive, negative. You may have this only, like, for example, in a given range, or you may have it across all codes. For INL, usually it is showing a systematic change and then it may change its polarity say suppose you just see an increase in the error then suddenly that error jumps to zero or negative and again it starts increasing. or you may see it is increasing and then it's decreasing so it depends exactly the way that we put the components and the way the variations are happening across x y on the layout exactly it's, it's a cumulative effect. That's why it will not capture random variations because usually they are plus minus. The average of the mismatch is zero. It's like that. If you look at average of any mismatch between two component values, average is zero across many of these components. That's why INL usually don't show, doesn't show too much fluctuations. It, it's like, a, yeah, it's an integral, so it's like a low pass rate. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so therefore, how to do that? Therefore, this is histogram. And in fact, this examples given from data conversion handbook will give you also an idea how, how actually they look like. Okay. So here, what happens is we cannot simulate. We want to actually generate codes. So what it simply is done, and it is called histogram method, is that we just give an input which has almost equal distribution of uh, equal distribution across all values, analog input. That can happen only if you have a kind of triangular waveform because it has a constant slope and therefore it with equal probability covers all values within the full scale range. But to make sure that it covers even the mean and max, we have to go with a triangular waveform of which the amplitude is a little above full scale. Therefore, at the boundary points, you will get more samples than you expect. Therefore, that is just because artificial you have added to the samples to make sure all other values are taken care. 
And interestingly, it is doesn't matter because as we discussed, offset and gain error are not an issue. Eventually, we are not so worried about how much initial points are deviated or how much the final points are deviated. We are mainly interested in the middle points. So we can skip a few quotes from the beginning, a few quotes from the end, and then just look at the characteristics of this uh, histogram. Okay, so how it is done is a very simple thing. See, this is like a periodic triangular waveform. So you can collect samples over many cycles. We need to do that because we cannot, in measurements, we cannot do one measurement. Because every measurement, if you perform, if you measure anything in the lab, you may have already seen. If you do any kind of measurement, just test, it is impossible to reproduce. If you measure something now and measure it after five minutes, you will not guess now. So therefore, measurement is an error-prone process. Therefore, we have to take measurement many cycles. That's why you will have many cycles of this triangular waveform. And as you see, these dotted lines determine the mean and marks, which will give us the full scale. Full scale is between these two horizontal dotted lines. Whatever goes beyond them is just extra margin we are keeping to make sure that we are not reducing number of samples below what we want. Okay, so this is ADC under test, and this waveform is given to the ADC. This waveform is not very fast. This is static characteristics. So, it's not a very fast. So, otherwise, we will end up issue of the settling. So, then you have the sampling clock generator. It samples the input and then eventually operating frequency of ADC, whatever you are design, you have designed for. So, this ADC will give you codes, say, unbeat code. So, you can store all of them in memory. And then you can sample them and transfer them to computer. Some intermediate memory transfer them to computer. You can sample with the same frequency, but because usually transfer to the computer may be slow, you can sample them every K samples. That means you can collect samples, but reading from the memory could be at a slower rate, which is okay. That's not a problem because you can repeat this process continuously. Okay, so now what will happen? When you run an ADC this way, and then you transfer codes to computer. So for every code, you have, say, some number of occurrences. So therefore, suppose you have 1,000 code, all zeros. OK, not let's forget about initial and final. Let's all codes, half of them 0, half of them 1. Say, suppose you have 1,000 code like that. You have 1,000 code when you have the same code plus 1. 1000 same code minus 1. If you have an ADC which has linear characteristics, distribution of number of occurrences of code across all codes is uniform. That means you will see an histogram where all bars are equal, have equal height. Right? So I will show you something here. I will get, I will go back to this previous slide again. This is an example. Yeah? Let's assume we collect total number of cycles empty. T means total. Total number of cycles across all codes. Ideally, if you assume from all zeros to all ones, of course, you get more samples at the lower codes and higher codes because we have margin. So that's why it is called overflow hits. But let's assume we have an ideal case when we are exactly at the mean and max. That means these horizontal lines exactly sit at the Peak and deep of this triangular waveform. So, what we expect is how many samples per code we expect if total number of samples are empty. And we have how many codes? For example, here two are missing, first and last. But overall, we have two to the power n codes, right? And we have total number of hits for all codes empty. So, what would be ideally number of hits per code? Ideally, what we expect if ADC is linear. No, no, these are codes. This is not frequencies. Though. These are just codes, like all zeros, then all zeros followed. Say, suppose three bits triple zero, double zero one, zero one zero, zero one one. For these, these codes are written over here. 
And then for each code, you have number of occurrences. And suppose total number of codes which are generated in this process are empty. So what is for an ideal ADC? What do you expect to see for every code in this histogram? This shows eventually how many how many hits you get per code. So what do you expect? Same number exactly because they are equally probable because you are sweeping input with a linear in a linear fashion and you are exactly starting from mean you are ending at max and you get total number of samples empty and then you have 2 to the power n codes so how much should be the number expected number of occurrence per code empty empty divided by 2 to the power n correct so therefore, we expect to see this histogram, which was number of occurrences per code, to have equal height of heights across all codes, and each one of them is empty upon two to the power. Simple, right? This is what we expect. Right now, I'm not talking about this uh, adding margin to cover full scale. I assume we are an ideal case. Now, if it is showing nonlinearity. Like means the characteristics of ADC is not linear. Then we expect some codes have more hits and some codes less hits. Because if you know, remember from yesterday lecture, when we have nonlinearity, the width of segments increases for some range of the input and for some range it reduces. Therefore, for those cases you get less heat. For those which have wider segment, you will get more hits. That's why this is called wide code. We have white code, narrow code. So therefore, you will get the more occurrences for those codes. So effectively, the skew you see in these bars is a measure of DNL, right? So this is the way that to effectively get that. So going back to this, to summarize is like that. Let's assume total number of samples for all codes. Here, two codes are missing, 0 and 2 to the power n minus 1 because they are used to have one code beyond full scale to make sure full scale is covered. Okay, so therefore we have 2 to the power n minus 2 codes. Co uh, 2 to the power n minus 2 codes starting from decimal code 1 to decimal code 2 to the power n minus 2. And total number of samples are empty. Empty. T is total. Okay, so when I say MT. So now we normalize them. We normalize this H of this number to total number because if you run this for three cycle of waveform, you will get more codes. If you run it for ten cycles, you will get even more codes. So we need to normalize. How to normalize it? We just simply normalize it to total number of codes. So therefore, for if we assume that here, of course, here what uh, I have written is this per code, number of occurrences per code MT of N. MT alone without N means total. And MT of N means MT for every code. So if you just divide it, this is just normalize it, the total number of codes, you will get some uh, normalized values. Okay, so therefore we just normalize it to the total number of hits expected so one more thing also is not expected you can actually take average you can just take average of the number of hits per code because some of them appear with less hits some of them with more hits you just take average that you and use it for normalization in fact that's why here we write it that way so you have an actual normalized h of n and then you have the average h of n your ideal value h of n is a normalized value of the occurrences. So, if you look at this normalized value, if, if the actual normalized value and the average value are same, that means you have the ideal case or ideal value and the actual value are same means you have a linear characteristics. But if the actual value is less, that means you have a negative differential in a linear. If it is more than one, 
that means you have positive nonlinearity. So therefore, DNL eventually will tell you how much is this ratio different from one. So therefore, instead of looking at the width of the segment, we are looking number of occurrences of code which is proportional to the width of segment. If you have a wider segment, you will get more hits. If you have a narrower segment, you will get less hits. Therefore, instead of having width of segment, which is not easy to measure, you will get another parameter, which is number of hits for a code. And number of hits is proportional to the width of segment. Therefore, number of hits eventually will give you the difference of number of hits with respect to with difference of a number of hits for a code with respect to expected value will give you deviation from ideal case. That is eventually a measure of DNL. So that's why effectively DNL for a given code is the actual normalized hit value divided by ideal value minus one because if these two are equal, so this difference is zero. Eventually you have equal number of hits. So this is Q. You know, the ratio of these heights is actually ratio of segments. It's exactly ratio of segments. Therefore, if you use ideal number, that you, ideal values, because you have overall how many codes? 2 to the power n minus 2 codes. So number of occurrences per code is empty upon 2 to the power n. Here, 2 to the power n minus 2 because two codes are uh, dropped. So ratio of this is ideal case. So now in some cases, number of hits are below the ideal case. So that means ratio of this number to this shows how much that segment is shrunk with respect to ideal segment. How much is the ideal size of segment? 1 LSP. So therefore, ratio of these two lines will tell you how much this LSP, the segment which corresponds to these consecutive codes has been shrunk. Or has been expanded. So, therefore, it's a measure of DNL. And this is a very simple method and it is used in practice. So, they just get this. So, and this, this eventually will give you the DNL. So, how will it look like? It will look like this because it's a normalized map. So, this also will change between 1 and minus 1. Uh, sorry, 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.5. Pick to pick is 1. So, it will give you the I, this is the way eventually DNL will look like after measurement. So this is the actual hits and this is the calculated DNL, which is eventually the ratio of the height of this hit with respect to expected hit minus 1. So that is DNL. Actually, we have transition points, right? Transition points are not at the center point. Center point is between two transition points. Yeah? So here, what will happen? These transition points are moving to the left or moving to the right. Therefore, width of the segment will change. Center point of segment ideally will remain as it is, but, but transition points are changing. What generates codes is not the center point or transition points. Center point only is defined as a center value, the analog of center value of the segment. And then because we are mapping one segment to a single code in a duty converter, we just define center of that segment. That's it. But center of segment doesn't play any role in the actual conversion. Actual conversion is controlled by the boundaries of the segment. And of course, ideally, when, when we, we talk about an ideal ADC, center point is the average of the two boundary points. But if you look at that, those points, and then look at the transition, moving the transition points, so this center point may not be the center point of the actual segments. Actual segments are not symmetric anymore. Some of them are narrow, some of them are wide. And actual, uh, ideal center points are not actual center points anymore. But here, this heat depends on the movement of transition points. See, if all transition points again move by the same value, again you will get equal number of hits. 
That's why offset will not show up here. And this is what we want. All it will show up here is the skew. And the skew means that how uh, a transition point at code n and transition point at code n plus 1 with respect to each other happen. If both of them move by the same factor, their difference still is one segment, one elastic. So it will show by the same. Yes. No, center point only tells you about the, see, because we are defining a boundary. You can define a boundary only by a boundary. Don't talk about even center. In fact, center point is used only to generate that line. Let's put it that way. Otherwise, your segment is defined by mean and mass. That's it. And that these are the points that actually uh, change the code. Yeah, I mean, practically, we don't use center point in the actual data conversion operation. Yes. We don't use that. And yes, that's a good question. Yes, yes, that is possible. We'll explain that as well. Because in many cases, you may want to measure the NL, INL for a single tone. Triangular waveform is not a single tone. But single tone doesn't give you equal probability. So you have, we have two problems. But it is possible to solve that problem as well. If you have a sine wave, and then you assume that you are generating codes ideally, okay, using an ideal linear ABC, okay, linear ABC, and you have, say, many cycles of this sine wave to generate enough number of codes. Same experiment we do with the sine wave, but with an ideal ABC. Will you get equal hits or codes? You will not get. You say no. Why? Yes. So sometimes it has exactly for for the duration of the sine wave where you have the maximum slope, you have maximum variation. So during that time, because we are going with a uniform sampling, so during that time you will get uh, you will have m uh, small number of codes for each code because quickly code changes. When you reach to the peak or deep of the sine wave, slope is almost zero. So you will get many of the hits at the max code and the mean code, and the codes close to them because the slope is very low. So therefore, you will get a non-uniform distribution. Therefore, all you need to do for a single tone is that to denormalize. That means now you have a non-uniform distribution of input samples, you have non-uniform distribution of codes because non of non-linearity of the ADC. So you have two effects combined in one. But you already know the histogram distribution for the input signal. So all you need to do is that you need to denormalize or eventually de-embed that effect. So therefore, you will get, suppose, this kind of histogram. But you know what is the histogram for sine wave, ideal histogram. So therefore, you need to effectively Divide it. It's like a, what is called pre-distortion. What we do is that we use, uh, how do we in advance reduce distortion? We know what is the distortion, which is produced by, say, for example, some module. Say, this is used, for example, in power amplifiers. So we know what kind of distortion it generates. So we distort the input signal, which gives, after that distortion will give you the linear. So it's like a equal uh, pre-emphasis. It's like pre-emphasis. So therefore, we know the distribution with respect to that, and we, so therefore, two nonlinearity, nonlinear effects are combined together. In this method, yeah, in this in this um, reference for this method, an example of sine wave is given. If you are, I because of shortage of time, I didn't include it, but. Uh, it tells you exactly how to do that. In fact, what will happen is that because mean and max codes, which are overflow codes here, actually they happen more often even there. So therefore, this overflow codes increase further for the sign. But only one thing keep in mind is that early codes, a few codes from the beginning, a few codes from end are not included in this analysis because we don't have uniform distribution. And this is what I told you yesterday. In measurement, you can't get INL directly. You get actually DML. But then you can calculate INL from. 
That's why the next step will be this. And as you can observe also practically, DNL will look more like a kind of fluctuation, and INL is more smooth because INL is an integration. It's eventually summation. Of course, it's not integration summation. Okay, this is just uh, some of the constraints that we need to follow and keep in mind for this method. So I have summarized them over. Any question? Okay, so then uh, from next lecture, I will start combining two topics alternately. In fact, there will be three topics alternately. Which is fine because this is mixed signal, so it should be mixed. <laughs> and also, you will not feel bored to have only one topic data conversion. So, it's all about mixed signal. Okay.